Coming up in this differently formatted episode, we look at Romic software. I continue with the pretend business, and I end with a typing. Let's get on then. Romic Software began life in the middle of 1982, providing games for a range of micros including the VIC-20, ZX81 and BBC. It was formed by two people, but their names are different depending on which interview you read. Crash Magazine in January 1985 claimed they were called Mike Barton and Steve Clark, ex-members of Rabbit Software. However, an earlier interview in Home Computing Weekly states they were called Mike Barton and Jerry Rose. Now I think Home Computing Weekly was correct, as they go on to say that the name Romic comes from R.O. from Jerry Rose and M.I.K. from Mike, which makes sense really. A feature in Games Computing identifies Steve as a programmer who left Rabbit Software with Mike and actually owns 10% of Romic. Other programmers named include Darren Hall and Chris Ratcliffe. Anyway, the company was set up with £40,000, £10,000 each from Mike and Jerry and a loan of £20,000. Like many small companies at the time, everyone did everything from the accounts to cleaning, packaging games and of course checking any new games sent to them by freelance programmers. Pushing out adverts in early magazines brought them some success. In the early ones they promised to release a new game every month and that they were moving into new markets such as Atari, Spectrum and Lynx. Sure enough, in June 1983, they began to advertise their first Spectrum games. Color Clash, Galactic Trooper, 3D Monster Chase and Spectra Smash. Notice that the advert says 3D Monster Maze. However, in the very next advert the next month, this has been changed to the correct name of 3D Monster Chase. No idea what happened there though. Looking at the product codes, the first game was Galactic Trooper, with a product code of G5001. Galactic Trooper, destroy the Galactic Attack Force and stop them landing on Earth. This is a simple yet addictive shooter with a few twists. You control a fighter below a set of vertical columns. In these are deployed aliens by the mothership, hovering at the top of the screen. As you shoot them, they get replenished, so this is a never-ending game really. When the columns get full, the aliens change colour and drop down. If they hit the ground, they burst into a small explosion, and you obviously have to avoid that, and this adds a little extra pearl to the gameplay. The columns soon get full though, which means it's just a matter of surviving. Occasionally you can hit the large saucer at the top if you manage to clear one of the columns, but it doesn't destroy it for very long and it's soon back. The graphics are small, mostly user-definable graphics, and they move in character squares. Gameplay is great though, and I quite like this. Sound is fairly basic, with mostly beeps and a few machine code effects, but overall, not a bad little shooter for their first Spectrum release. The screenshot on the inlay though is not the Spectrum version, and that's an important element to the story, as we shall find out. The next game, with a product code of G5002, was Color Clash. This game has to have one of the worst commercial loading screens I've seen. What the hell is going on? Anyway, onto the game. The inlay looks like a Commodore or a VIC-20 version, but anyway. The idea is to control a paintbrush and rid the world of invading paint pots, intent on painting the planet nice colours. There are four different levels, and in the first one you have to move around the edges of the boxes, filling them in as you go. Yes, it's an Amadar clone. If you get in a tight spot, you can use your limited grenades to get rid of the pots. Complete this and the next level starts, and here you have to get a brush that looks more like a roller, to the flashing thing at the bottom of the screen, and to do this you press the fire button and hope for the best really. 
The third level is the same as the first, but with the limitation you can only fill in boxes that are next to each other. And the final level, well, this is a light cycles ripoff. Fend off two moving pots and try to block them in. A simple game with varying gameplay. Small user definable graphics, character based movement, but there is some gameplay in there. Sound is fine for a game of this age, but we do get the death march if you die. Oh dear. One more thing to note. The game on Spectrum Computing claims to support Quran Microspeech, as do several of the Romic titles, but none of the versions I tried worked. The third game with a product code of G5003 is 3D Monster Chase. When the Spectrum came out, many of its early users moved from the ZX81. 3D Monster Maze on that machine was superb, and Spectrum users were hopeful that that version would appear soon. Sadly, it never did. There were many look-alike, like Zigzag from DKtronics for example, and this one, 3D Monster Chase. The idea of the game is to escape the maze inhabited by monsters. To do this, you have to search for keys. There are different keys, and only one for each level, so you do have to find the right one. Taking this back to the starting point will trigger a bomb, which you then have to locate and defuse. The game uses solid 3D graphics that look nice on the adverts and inlay, but move in jumps, like all other 3D maze games. There's a radar at the top of the screen showing you and the monsters, which does help a bit. The sound isn't too bad for a 16k title, but there are two bleeps every time you move forward, which is confusing. You would think that a single effect would represent a single movement, but it doesn't. Having two beeps makes you think you've moved too far. The controls are sticky too, often not responding, and all too often you get killed by a monster. You do have some grenades that you can use to try and kill them, but these have to be used at a precise point when the monster is a precise distance from you. There are three floors to explore, and these are accessible by walking into dead ends. When you do this, the floor will go red or blue. Red is for down and blue is for up. If you then want to proceed, you just walk into the wall. Keys can be found on any floor too, so there's a lot of running about and monster dodging. During my time with this game, I never actually found the key, until I was recording the actual footage for this feature. I then had to run around trying to find a bomb, which I never did. Not a bad 3D maze game, just a bit, well, annoying really. The fourth game, with a product code of G5004, was Spectra Smash. You can tell straight away from the inlay what type of game this is. Oh dear. You know the game by now. There are hundreds of versions for the Spectrum and other platforms. Your plane flies across the screen and gets lower each pass. You have to bomb the city skyscrapers to clear a path to land. The game differs slightly in that you get guns shooting at you, which just makes it even more annoying really. The game uses user definable graphics that move in character squares, and a standard set of machine code sound effects found in many early games. The controls work, but then again it's just about lining your plane up to the tallest building and dropping a bomb. Not very exciting, and it's been done so often now that there's just not enough of a game in there. But probably knowing this, Romic added another game on the tape for you. Hey! Ah, oh, it's Breakout. Right. A bat and ball smash the wall game. Yeah, it's not very exciting, not very good. Let's move on. Now at this point, did you notice the inlays? Romic always put screenshots of the games on the inlays, and Mike claimed this because they are an honest company. What you see on the inlay is the game you get, he says, not some artwork designed to make false promises. 
But remember the first two games? They didn't have Spectrum screenshot, did they? Hmm, okay, moving on. August arrived, and so did another Spectrum game for the product code of G5005, Shark Attack. The idea is to protect the jellyfish, trap the sharks, and fill the screens with your net. Sounds easy, and this game is similar to Quicks in the arcade. You control what looks like a swashsticker though, trailing behind a net. You use this to trap the sharks and protect the jellyfish. If a shark eats the jellyfish, it becomes a super shark, which can eat your nets. Once you have surrounded the jellyfish, so the sharks can't get to it, you then just have to move around filling up the screen with nets, until a certain point when the game decides you've done enough, and it moves on to the next level, and you get an extra jellyfish to protect. The game has user-definable graphics, character movement, yes it's all there, but it does play a tune when moving. It's not actually a bad game, quite enjoyable once you get into it. It does allow two players to compete, but not at the same time, just one after the other. At this point, Romic were employing four full-time programmers across all the computers they covered, and giving them 20% royalties, which sounds pretty good. In September, the existing Spectrum games were joined by two ZX81 games, Galactic Trooper and a compilation called Super 9. Galactic Trooper was a conversion of the Spectrum game, and the ZX81 version is very good, and I enjoy playing the game on both formats. More ZX81 games followed in November, including Galaxy Jailbreak and Bubble Bugs. It was around this time that Romic stated they wanted to be one of the best software companies in 18 months' time, so Calculating that date, that would be October 1984. Let's keep that in mind then. Finally, in December 1983, they released two more Spectrum games, Sub and Astroplaner. The first one, with a product code of G5006, was Sub. This is one of those very basic simulations. You are given control of your Sub, and can move port, starboard, and change the speed. Using these, along with your radar, you have to track down the enemy. If you manage to stay awake long enough, you may be able to destroy them, but I never did. The game consists mainly of number watching. The range indicates if you're getting closer or further away, and if you wait long enough, the enemy may even appear on the radar. Oh, the excitement! I didn't have the patience for this game, to be honest. It's not the sort of thing I enjoy. It's written in basic, and there's nothing that attracts me to it at all. Moving on to the next game, with a product code of G5007, and it's Astroplaner. I covered this in my Defender shootout, because it's a sort of a Defender clone really, albeit a very bad one, and I can use that review here. The first thing you notice is the colour. Not black as the arcade, but green. The next thing you notice is the ship. It looks terrible. In fact, most things in this game look poor. The basics are there, the aliens that kidnap humans, the smooth scrolling landscape, but there's no radar which makes things a little tricky. There's no smart bomb either, so you have to rely on your lasers. There's a slight twist in that you have to pick up the humans, or in this game mutants, and carry them to a factory, which was very difficult to see due to the colours. Different aliens attack and after a few seconds, you will inevitably be destroyed by a fast flying light blue projectile that seems to just appear out of nowhere and home in on your ship. Strangely you can fly through the aliens, but not their lasers or bombs. The sound is very irritating, and in fact, the whole thing soon annoys, to the extent that you'll want to throw it in the bin. Let's move on, and 1984 has arrived. Andromic hit the magazines with large colourful adverts in February, advertising, um, well, something. Not really sure quite what, though. A bit of a mystery. Maybe the promise of a new game every month was proving tricky to achieve. Things then went a bit quiet, although they did run a competition in Home Computing Weekly in May, but that was just to keep their name in the press, I think. October came and went. Remember that date? Well, I'm not sure they actually managed to become one of the best software companies. Maybe they were busy working on a special game. Well, that's not too far from the truth. In October 1984, Romic joined forces with a famous breakfast cereal manufacturer and released what they claimed to be the first ever promotional computer game. 
the Weetabix vs the Titches. You could only get this game from Weetabix, but it was written by Romic. The advert showed a Dragon 32 and the chance to win one. However, Dragon Data went into liquidation in July 1984, so it's interesting to know if these were liquidated stock or they were just given away or found in a skip. Anyway, on to the game. The story is so bad. The short version is, the Weetabix are under attack from the Titches. Dunk, one of the Weetabixes, has a supply of Weeta rockets, which he can fire at the Titches. Dunk has to grab a rocket and fire it. Yes, it's a Space Invader clone, sort of. Dunk has limited energy, displayed on the left. This is used up by practically everything. If the Titches fire lightning at you, a shield is automatically put over your head, but this uses energy, as does running and firing. The rockets, apparently, are placed randomly on screen by the other Weetabix crew. These are Bixie, Crunch, Brains and Brian. Mm. Pity they don't just give them to Dunk, instead of just throwing them randomly. That would be the sensible thing to do. The sprites are large and move smoothly enough, but they do flicker on occasion and the sound isn't too bad. It actually plays quite well and I hope Romic made some money out of this and regained some of their appetite to get more games out. In December 1984, they made an appearance with adverts in a few magazines. A rather spooky advert. Again, not really advertising anything really, other than the company name. They did release a new Spectrum game around this time too, called Beecher, with a product code of G5008. The instructions for this are very sparse. Move around a school located on Sirius B, Avoid teachers and collect keys. You have to collect all of the keys in all of the rooms to complete the game. However, looking at some rooms, this may be impossible, because when you collect a key, it leaves behind an immovable blob. The graphics don't really mix with the story or setting. There are skulls flying about, for example. What sort of school is this? and the rooms are just graphic blocks laid out in different patterns. There are doors in each room that lead to other rooms, so you just have to run around and try and not get killed. The graphics are user-definable again and moving character jumps, but the movement is that fast it makes no difference. There are some nice sound effects in there, although the game does stop to play them, which usually means it's compiled in basic. Not a bad game, but I just don't think you can complete it. It's only a small game map too, so armed with an immunity poke, I tried to find out. I discovered that the problem I thought might hinder the game was not really an issue. Once you leave the room, any blobs left behind by keys already collected vanish, so you can go back and collect the keys that were blocked before. However, once all of the keys had been collected, even in the annoying room that flips the controls, I still could not complete the game. There was a letter S on one of the walls, and I thought that might be the exit, but it didn't work. I visited every room, and still had no idea. I then went back and watched the RZX playback, and it seems the S marker on the wall is the exit indeed, and you need 101 keys to complete it. But I had managed to get 102 somehow, which meant I couldn't complete the game. Sure enough, when I went back and didn't collect the final key, the game could be completed. Not very good if you spent ages trying to get all of the keys, only to discover you've collected one too many. Anyway, back to the story. Could this game spark their return? In January 1985, they did an interview for Crash Magazine, where they explained their absence, and tried to get interest in the company and games again. They say they moved away from the Spectrum scene because there were too many software houses already, and it didn't need another one. Hmm, I smell marketing talk. They say they will come back into the Spectrum scene around spring of 1985 with the role-playing and fantasy games. They're also unhappy with the current trend in advertising. The claims of Mega Games is, according to them, just not good for the industry. They think the Advertising Standards Authority should step in and take action over false advertising. Now that sounds like sour grapes to me. They then say that the computer games currently are in their third age. First came simple Pac-Man-like games and arcade clones. The second age were games like Timegate from Quicksilver 
and the third age were games like Manic Miner. They say that they will be the first company to enter the fourth age of computing games with something very special, but don't say what. Again, is this marketing speech? Very probably, because they also claimed to be working on a secret fifth generation game due to be released in autumn of 1985. Another date to remember. For simplicity, let's say October 1985, a year from their last predicted date that nothing happened on. Okay. Then it all went quiet for Romic. Presumably, they were working hard on their fourth and fifth generation games. Sadly, not. In June 1985, they ceased trading and vanished. No fourth or fifth generation games ever appeared. Their games, though, live on, on many formats through emulation and the retro scene. Some of their games came with this bit of paper, enabling you to enter championships. Nothing was ever heard of this, at least to my knowledge, and another mystery will never be solved. A small company producing a lot of games on a lot of machines. Honesty was their mantra, but in the end, marketing and better quality companies like Ultimate Play the Game and Ocean beat them every time. In previous episodes, I got the hardware together, set up a stock control system, and managed to request details from distributors about supplying me with items to sell. Next, I need to buy things and track them. My business is still not quite ready to start yet. I have no stock. As I'll be a mail order company, I won't need premises. But conversely, I'll need envelopes, labels and general stationery. It would be handy to have some kind of record of these, maybe create another stock file for non-game items. However, I decided not to bother. There will only be a few different sized envelopes, and I can see how many I have by looking on a shelf. If I actually had a shelf and envelopes, of course. This is all make-believe. Things are moving fast in the make-believe world, and it won't be long before the games I ordered last episode will be here. Now I need to track the game orders. To do this, I'll be using a spreadsheet. This will let me enter the games I ordered, the date, the cost, and the date when they were received. I can also use this method to track stationery if I need to. Now I tested several spreadsheets, but in the end opted for this one, OmniCalc 2 by Microsphere. It looks very professional. It boasts a nice feature set, and it claims on the front to support micro drives and a full-size printer. Exactly what I'm looking for. Now, can I get it onto disk? The manual states that once it's loaded, it will detect interface 1, and if a key is pressed in the first 10 seconds, it will automatically save the program to cartridge. And this worked in an emulator, but as we know, that's no guarantee. And sure enough, the plus D interface failed to detect interface 1. It just went straight into the program with a question to load or initialize, which is how the program starts. Looking at the emulated cartridge, there's just one file on it, However, I can't break or merge into it. I went through many attempts to get this to work, even reverting to using the snapshot button, and for some reason this randomly crashed the spectrum when saving. Not what you need when you've just spent hours entering data. For the record, I also tried Trans Express, tape to microdrive, and a modern snap to tap to load that in, but everything just failed. I didn't want to start using ViewCalc, as when I looked at it last time, it wasn't very good. And also, all the load and save commands are in the machine code section. A new strategy was needed. I needed something more reliable, and so started yet another trawl of software. After a bit of testing, I settled for this, the spreadsheet from Micron. It's written in BASIC and it's a quite old program, and it runs quite slowly. But it does work, it looks like a normal spreadsheet, and because it's written in BASIC, I can change the load and save commands to be compatible with the plus D. Getting it onto disk was easy. Once I'd loaded it from tape and changed the line that saved the data, I just saved it out, and there you go. I now have the entire program on disk and ready to start. At least it looks like a modern spreadsheet. First, we create a new spreadsheet by pressing the end command. I enter eight columns and 50 rows. That should be enough now, at least for the January order. I can add headers by pressing L for label and entering some text. By default, the width of each column is 7 characters. This can be changed, but it affects every column rather than just the one you want. 
So this means, to make it easier for myself, I just use abbreviations for some of the games and headings. I have order number, order date, game, quantity, cost, total and received columns. To add an underline to make it look decent, I just pressed L and just put a series of minor signs in there. The order number for this batch will be HOB1, referring to Hobbit Distributions, the make-believe company I placed an order with, and the date will be January 85. I plan to use a spreadsheet for every month for every order. I now just have to go in and enter every game that I ordered, the quantity and cost. This is a very, very long process, mainly because the program is in basic, as mentioned before, but at least it works without crashing and saves properly. This package allows the use of functions to calculate either rows or columns as well. It provides a replicate function to copy cells and a very useful go to command that lets you move anywhere in the spreadsheet without all that tedious scrolling. This is particularly useful if you are at the bottom right of a spreadsheet and want to get back up to the top. Now there's some data in, let's add some functions. First we want to work out the total based on the quantity and cost. Pressing the E key to enter an expression, so I enter E3 times D3 and there's the total. Moving down I do the same for all the others. And again this is a very slow process, especially when you get to the bottom and everything scrolls up one line. I found the easiest thing to do is to use the go to command and drop down a further 10 lines, which means it doesn't scroll as much. Now that all the totals are in, let's add them all together and find out what the total sum of the order is. To do this I move to the empty cell at the bottom and press the S key, and this asks me for a range of cells I want to add up. And after a few seconds of thinking, there's the total cost of the games order. Now I can save this out by pressing the dollar sign, entering a name, in this case Jan85, and it gets written straight to disk. Marvellous! Once the order turns up, I can go through this and mark each game as being received. Now to print it out. The software only claimed compatibility with the ZX printer, but let's give it a try anyway. I press the P key, enter a range to be printed, and off we go. The printer's making a noise. Ah, it thinks it's a ZX printer, which means not only is it really slow, but we only get 32 characters. Hmm, the rest of the characters appear on the next page. Oh dear, well, it's the best we're going to get, and at least we've got a working spreadsheet now. From the start, I knew this game would not work. Originally published in October 1984 in Popular Computing Weekly, and written by Kevin Ridley, just looking at the listing reveals why. Look at the first few lines. There is a call there to a subroutine at line 901. And the listing stops at 899. So there's a whole subroutine missing. I checked issues of the magazine after this, in case there were any letters or corrections, but couldn't find any. I'm hoping that the code at line 900 onwards is just for user-definable graphics, which I can add myself if the rest of the code works. Typing out this game I did in small installments, saving each step just in case there was some kind of disaster. I typed out the game using an emulator as it's easier. It reduces the risk of a crash and enables me to save faster. From start to finish it took me about a week, but obviously this was done in small 15 or 20 minute sessions. If, like in this case, the game has a large set of instructions, I usually don't type those out until I know it's working. Finally, when the listing is all typed out, it's time to try it out for the first time. I always expect an error, especially in this case, as the game has a complete subroutine missing. Obviously missing the instructions at the moment, we get a star field, and yes, it's supposed to be a white background. Maybe we'll change it later. And our first error, variable not found. Looking at line 305, it seems the C array is missing, and sure enough, printing C, open brackets 0, close brackets, gives us the same message. Looking at the listing where the variables are set, and it's not there. So either the listing is wrong, or this variable is set in the missing chunk of code. 
add it to the listing and run again, and another missing variable. In total, there were four arrays that had not been defined. Once they were in, the game ran. Obviously no graphics yet, but you can rotate the ship and fire. You can also move, but this causes the ship to vanish, and I think this is linked to the over command, which I'll check out later. The explosion when you hit a meteor is also out of alignment, and I suspect this is just a typo. So the next task is to work out which graphics is used for the ship and meteor, and in this case A is for up, B is for left, C is for down and D is for right, and the meteor is E. Not having the full listing means I don't know what the original graphics were like, so I'll just have to make them up. The ship I opted for is this design. I drew it out in a UDG program and wrote down the values so I could put them into the code. For the meteor, I did the same. With all the numbers, I then added it to the code and added it to the subroutine so they're set up when the game runs. Now we get a better idea of how it looks. I think the meteor needs a colour change, but I hope it doesn't break the detection of the laser. Next we need to sort out the ship movement. This uses the over command and is not really working, so let's try removing it. Ooh, that made it a bit worse, didn't it? On the plus side, I've now fixed the rotation. Back to the meaty movement then. Okay, I'll add back the over one command and the laser needs the same fix. Now the explosions. They need to be removed from the screen and also one of the blocks is out of place. I added the changes to the remove meteor code and that should fix it. This was tricky because the listing was accurate, at least it was the same as the magazine, so now it was time to change one of the lines to see which bit was not working right. I spent a while trying to sort this out and still couldn't get it for a while. Look at this, here is the position of the explosion. HL and HC depict the line and column, and even hard coding in the position the top graphic still draws in the same place, the wrong place. Ah, yes, I see now. There's a comma where there should be a semicolon. Damn it, that's fixed now. So, just the ship movement and instructions then. I had to add an extra line to remove the old position of the ship when it moved and print the new one, as there wasn't one in the listing, and it works much better. Now let's get those instructions in. Ah, it looks like the screen colours are set up here. That should look a lot better. Let's give it a try. Ah, yes. That's good, but the meteor's now printing wrong. Uh, okay. Quick fix for that. And that's it. I think it's finally done. A game that had bits of the listing missing, no user-definable graphics, no array setup, and a few errors, is now ready to play for the first time in nearly 40 years. It's a small asteroid clone where you have to destroy the yellow meteors, and randomly you will get a red one which homes in on your ship, and they are tricky. The game starts with a single meteor, but can advance to three if you're good enough. Not a bad little game, really. I definitely need a drink after that, though. <laughs>